Good morning, everyone. I'm Marissa Khurma, the director of the Middle East program here at the Wilson Center. Welcome to our event this morning, the Gaza ceasefire, what's next? We have a very distinguished panel this morning to discuss the latest developments on the Israeli-Palestinian arena and the Biden administration's policies in the region, particularly after the Gaza ceasefire that ended the violence that took the lives of more than 250 Palestinians, including 66 children in Gaza and 13 Israelis, including two children. MEP, is very glad to welcome President and CEO of the Wilson Center, Ambassador Mark Green, to introduce our panel this morning. We also welcome Acting Assistant Secretary Joey Hood to give remarks on the Biden administration's policy. We also welcome His Excellency Martaz Zahran, Ambassador of Egypt to the United States to discuss Egypt's role in brokering the negotiation as well as the Washington Institute's David Makovsky to discuss his views after his most recent trip to Israel and the West Bank. And last but not least, Chair of the Middle East Program, Ambassador James Jeffrey, who will discuss the geostrategic implications of the ceasefire and conflict. Ambassador Green, the Zoom floor is yours. Great, thanks, Marissa. And welcome everyone to the Wilson Center. I am Mark Green, and I have the honor of leading our remarkable team of scholars and analysts. Congress chartered the Wilson Center a little over five decades ago for, in their words, strengthening the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. In other words, we seek to discern lessons of foreign policy and offer them up to policymakers, analysts, and influencers. Nowhere is that mission more important or more challenging than in and around Gaza and regarding one of the world's most persistent conflicts that between Israelis and Palestinians. On May 10th, we all saw in the most graphic of ways, an escalation of confrontations involving Israelis, Palestinians and police in Jerusalem, from peaceful protests to violent protests, to rocket fire and airstrikes, from the use of rocks to the use of incendiary balloons and drones. The violence took a staggering toll, many dead on both sides, and an estimated half a billion dollars in damage. As we all know, there are a few places in the world where violence can accelerate and escalate more quickly than here. There are a few places where ideologies are more hardened than right here. Hamas was designated a foreign terrorist organization nearly a quarter century ago and still refuses to recognize the state of Israel. Thankfully, on May 21st, 11 days after the fighting began, a ceasefire was secured and the violence came to an end. There's no doubt but that Egypt played a pivotal role in the mediation and communications that helped make the ceasefire possible. We all desperately hope the settlement is permanent or at least lasting, but we all fear that it could be fleeting. In other words, the future of the region remains uncertain and too often unsettled. While many of us have disagreements with the government of, Is of Egypt on several fronts, on matters of human rights and civil rights, for example, we also must acknowledge the role that Egypt continues to play in trying to help strengthen and broaden the ceasefire. As I said when I began, the Wilson Center's mission is to discern key lessons and try to bring them forward for key players and key decision points. And nowhere are these lessons more important or more urgent or more complex in this troubled land. And so we ask what's next? The last major battle between Israel and Hamas was in 2014. So what made this time different? Today we have, as you heard from Marissa, a truly remarkable group of government officials and experts who can help us explore these questions and more. We will hear from Egypt's ambassador to the US, Mota Zara, to discuss his country's unique role in the ongoing conflict and recent peace negotiations. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining us at the Wilson Center. We will be joined by the State Department's Acting Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Mr. Joey Hood, who will give us an overview of the US government's role during these difficult days and as we look ahead. We'll hear from David Makovsky, Director of the Koret Project on Arab-Israeli Relations at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy who will tie these two country perspectives together and connect them to the broader international and historical context. Finally, we will hear from 
the Wilson Center's own Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, chair of the Middle East program. Marissa, back to you to get this truly intriguing conversation underway. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Green, for your opening remarks. Um, before I pass the floor uh, over to um, Das Hood, I'd like to just remind everyone that at any time during the webcast, you may submit a question by tagging at Wilson Center MEP via Twitter or by submitting an email to MEP at wilsoncenter.org. Das Hood, the floor is yours for your keynote address. Ms. Horma, thank you. Ambassador Jeffrey, Ambassador Green, Ambassador Zahran, Mr. Makovsky, it's a pleasure being here with all of you today and actually quite an honor uh, for me. And it's good to see you all again. Uh, I'm not planning on making big news today. Uh, I think uh, I will, however, give you a, a basic idea of uh, what the administration's approach was, uh, which I don't think will be uh, a lot of uh, news to you, but maybe to some of the viewers here, it'll be uh, worthwhile. Uh, basically, it's this. Uh, stop the dying, stabilize the situation, get humanitarian assistance in, and then look for ways that we can actually start putting in place the conditions and the parameters to be able to start talking about a, a two-state solution again. Um, because right now, uh, that prospect seems pretty far away. But when you look at this uh, unconditional mutual ceasefire uh, between Israel and the militants based in Gaza, we think it was a function of the intensive but quiet diplomacy the United States and our partners drove since the earliest hours of the conflict. We're grateful to our regional partners, especially President Sisi, and the senior Egyptian officials who played a critical role in all of this, but again, a quiet one. The King of Jordan, the Emir of Qatar also played important roles throughout those 11 days. From the beginning, President Biden was focused intensely on ending the conflict as quickly as possible with as few casualties as possible. Because sadly, we know from past experience that every day the conflict continues, more innocent lives would be lost. And we deplore, each one of those innocent deaths. We also knew the diplomacy by Twitter was not likely to achieve results, especially in that short of a time frame. So that's why we engaged in dozens of private calls and consultations from the secretary, the president, to myself, our deputy assistant secretary, Hadi Amr, who was out in the region. Uh, we did this in person, we did it by phone, uh, we did it out in the region and uh, talked to, to a lot of our regional counterparts along the way. We faced a lot of pressure to change our strategy along the way, but we kept our eyes on the ultimate goal of ending the conflict as soon as possible. Every day that the conflict went on, the bloodshed was heartbreaking, but we in concert with our partners were able to midwife a ceasefire in under 11 days, thanks to the hard work from our entire national security team here in Washington, our partners in the region, and our colleagues in Jerusalem. I think this all speaks to the utility uh, of this approach. There's a lot of important work still ahead to avoid future flashpoints and help rebuild, and then address underlying causes that led to this crisis, as I talked about in the beginning. Just as we were focused on bringing about a ceasefire through quiet diplomacy, we're gonna continue to put a great deal of thought into the longer term as well. That ceasefire is mostly held, but everybody who watches the region knows the situation remains really fragile. Palestinian militants are launching incendiary balloons and airborne explosive devices from the Gaza Strip. Israel is responding with airstrikes against Hamas sites. Fortunately, no one on either side has been injured so far, but if this continues, it's just a matter of time. We want to reduce the likelihood that this level of conflict happens again. So that's why we think it's essential to stabilize Gaza through a humanitarian response with partners from the United Nations, Egypt, Qatar, and other partners. So we're committed to working with all of them to provide that assistance and marshal other international support as we can for recovery efforts. We're going to support that recovery in partnership with Israel and the Palestinian Authority in a way that benefits Palestinians directly 
but does not benefit Hamas. We're working through the various actors to ensure that funding goes to Gaza through transparent, legitimate channels. And if you've ever seen the vetting procedures that we and our partners put in place, it's like a 60 page memo that I got to sign off on every year. It, let me tell you folks, it is intensive. So through all of that, we're providing more than $360 million in assistance to the Palestinians. That includes 38 million in new assistance for humanitarian efforts in both Gaza and the West Bank. And of that 38 million, 33 million is going to UNRWA to support its operations in both those locations. And then five and a half million will be going to other humanitarian partners. We're working with Congress to ensure these resources are available as soon as possible. And that assistance is gonna provide emergency shelter, food, relief items, healthcare, uh, mental health and psychosocial support for those who experience trauma. As I said, we're gonna be doing this through trusted, vetted, independent partners who distribute directly to the people in need, not through Hamas. Throughout all of this, we're committed to strengthening our engagement with the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people so that we can work with them toward a democratic and viable Palestinian state that upholds the rule of law, promotes freedom of expression and respects human rights. And I think we've seen in recent days why that's more and more important. President Biden has been crystal clear in saying that he believes Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity, and democracy. And the State Department, including this Bureau for Near Eastern Affairs, is entirely organized around this vision. To that end, we're strongly encouraging both the Palestinians and Israelis to avoid unilateral actions, including settlement activity, annexation of West Bank territory, and the demolition of Palestinians' homes, as well as incitement to violence and providing compensation for individuals in prison for acts of terrorism. As we've stated many, many times, we firmly oppose the eviction of people from homes they've lived in for generations, whether that's in Sheikh Jarrah, or elsewhere in Jerusalem. Because those types of actions exacerbate tensions and make a two-state solution more difficult to achieve. So we're gonna focus our efforts on an affirmative and practical approach that encourages constructive, positive steps that help keep the possibility of a negotiated two-state solution alive. And equally importantly, that just improves the lives of Palestinian people and Israeli people in tangible ways. We need to lift up Palestinian lives so they can enjoy the same level of prosperity as Israel, where GDP per capita is now higher than France or Japan, while GDP per capita in Gaza and the West Bank is just a few thousand dollars per year. And as we've stressed, we're gonna reaffirm our commitment to the historic status quo on the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount area. We hope to see a Jerusalem that respects all of its diverse inhabitants, and ensures everyone has equal opportunities to live, worship, build, and thrive in that city. With that, I'll turn the floor back over to you, Ms. Horma, and to our other guests. Thank you very much um, for your remarks this morning, and we'll get back to you with um, questions. Thank you, Dashud. Um, I'd like to um, now address Ambassador Zahran um, of Egypt. As uh, Ambassador Green mentioned, um, and as Das Hood mentioned as well, Egypt played a key role in brokering the ceasefire between Hamas and Israel um, in uh, last month. And your country continues to communicate with Hamas's leaders and also is the first Arab country to have signed a peace treaty with Israel. So tell us uh, more about Egypt's role. How did these talks evolve um, and what are the main features of this um, ceasefire, um, particularly moving forward, as uh, Das Hood mentioned that the situation remain, remains quite fragile. Ambassador Zahran. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Marissa, and thank you, Ambassador Green, uh, Ambassador uh, Hood, Ambassador uh, Jeffrey, and, uh, and also let me welcome um, uh, David Makovsky as well. So uh, basically, uh, le let me just start by saying that, uh, you know, historically, I don't need to enter into history. 
history is known to all of us. Uh, we all know who are the pioneers of peace in our part of the world. We know what Egypt has done uh, back during the Sudan years. But let me just mention something that uh, I need to, uh, to emphasize on because, uh, you know, we had in Egypt to withstand uh, a huge backlash uh, when we've uh, opted uh, for the option of peace. And that was within the Arab circle, of course, within the Arab world and the Islamic worlds and non-alignment and other uh, uh, organizations whereby Egypt had to, you know, either uh, stand its ground uh, firmly or uh, subside in, uh, you know, uh, heeding uh, the, the, the heat. So what we've done is we've stood our ground. And as we stood our ground, we've been able to transform mindsets. And this is extremely important. Wherever we are today, when it comes to the whole uh, depiction of, of of the region is because of that cornerstone, Egypt standing strong in full conviction of peace and the need to work to enlarge and expand on its peace option. So we've done that and uh, slowly but surely, we've seen the Madrid uh, peace conference happen. We've seen the Oslo Accords, we've seen the peace uh, 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 treaty with Jordan and just lately, we've seen uh, the other Arab countries in Israel come together uh, in, in terms of the Abraham Accords. Now, this is just a, back, uh, a backdrop. Ever since the split uh, between the West Bank and Gaza, 2007-2008, we had to endure a number of escalations, but not just sit there and watch, but actually to have an important cardinal pivotal role in terms of de-escalating and bringing back calm. So there is an accumulated experience here that Egypt uh, uh, was able to, uh, to, to accumulate. Now on the 10th of May, that was just another round of confrontation between Israel and Gaza. And that took place for a, con a continuation of 11 days until we managed to broker a ceasefire. Now, Operation Jerusalem Sword, the Palestinian name or the Guardians of the Walls, the Israeli name was uh, significantly different from the previous three rounds. And that was due to a number of, of factors. Uh, basically, an entangled political scene, not only in Israel or, the, or in Palestine, but throughout throughout the region. And let me just quickly mention that here that in Israel, uh, it was struggling to form a, a, a coalition government. In Israel, confrontations between Palestinians living in East Jerusalem and the Israeli security forces as a result of banning them from praying in Al-Haram Sharif. And of course, house evictions in Sheikh Jarrah and other neighborhoods. Now, civil unrest as well inside a number of cities within Israel with a significant Arab majority. That's the situation that uh, prevailed in Israel. And in Palestine, let me just say that the first round of parliamentary elections were announced, of course, by President Abbas, but were canceled later on when uh, Israel had refused to allow balloting in East Jerusalem. Uh, settler violence in occupied West Bank has also risen uh, 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 markedly in recent uh, in, in recent month of 2021, and the Palestinian economic outlook also remains precarious and subject to uh, numerous political security and health uh, risks, augmenting the level of frustrations. And people in, in Gaza remain besieged and and under a dire economic and humanitarian. Uh, uh, circumstance. Now, the region at large and, you know, relevant international uh, players, let me just say that several crises have hit the Middle East from Syria to Libya, Iraq and Yemen, putting additional burdens on their nations. Messages from the US, uh, some had interpreted in, in different ways. People uh, have seen a, 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 a US that is probably 
uh, more uh, prone or uh, or bound to uh, have a Middle East subside in its policy and its priority, uh, but others see differently. In Europe itself, Europe has shown some kind of confusion confusion when it comes to how to advance. We've seen also a quartet that ha hasn't been much of much help uh, uh, in, in recent years. And of course, COVID-19 with all its repercussions, all of these were extremely uh, uh, overwhelming, but also had an impact on abilities of those players who had put all their efforts into bringing, out, uh, bringing about a ceasefire a succeed. So uh, uh, nevertheless here, it's, you know, we've managed to do that in 11 days. And let me just say that in the midst of all this, the efforts of Egypt have been relentless. Uh, the ceasefire is part of what Egypt sees as a holistic approach. Now, after brokering the ceasefire, Cairo uh, moved in three parallel tracks. One is stabilizing the ceasefire, which is called in Arabic, you know, hosting Israeli uh, delegations and negotiating teams and both the Palestinian Authority uh, and Hamas in proximity talks to negotiate the terms and the requests of prolonged uh, of a prolonged ceasefire. Now, uh, such as economic and humanitarian arrangements, including reconstruction and humanitarian needs, and the ability to exploit uh, uh, resources in Gaza, whether in the sea, whether in the land. Now, all these issues were part of, or are still actually part of an ongoing effort that is exerted by Egypt uh, to sustain the ceasefire, to have the ceasefire hold and continue to hold. Now, another uh, uh, track is the, the prisoner swap track, which is also ongoing in, in these proximity talks and will continue. And the other uh, 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 track, which is also parallel here, is the intra-Palestinian track, which is one that Egypt has continuously ever since the divide uh, and the split happened in, in, in West Bank and Gaza, a continuous effort exerted by Egypt to bring about the Palestinians together under one legitimate uh, umbrella uh, 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 rule. Um, so th these are three important components of what we're trying to do. Now, revisiting the 2014 ceasefire agreement is also uh, uh, something that we wish to build on, meaning that we, we plan to change some of the roles and some of the rules that have uh, somehow depicted the game uh, it, uh, ever since 2014. Loopholes are there. We need to be able to be more stringent in whatever plans we have in terms of humanitarian assistance, in terms of reconstruction and rebuilding uh, 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 Gaza, and some of the practices need to change. Now, amongst them is a practice that we've seen in the past that basically saw cash flowing into, into Gaza. And that kind of uh, arrangement that we've had in the past needs to change for uh, a much more uh, responsible uh, uh, atmosphere to prevail. Now, Egypt's reconstruction efforts, it's uh, a, a quick uh, a reference that I could make at the end of my uh, presentation. Well, you know, Palestinians in Gaza cannot uh, pay the, the price and the consequences of regular confrontations between Hamas and Israel. They are the overwhelming majority in, in Gaza. The, the, the population in Gaza is around 2 million uh, 100,000. Uh, the overwhelming majority have no particular political uh, uh, affiliation, and they need to be catered to in terms of their needs, in terms of their livelihood. And this is part of what we see in Egypt as dissuading uh, uh, segments of the Palestinian society in, in Gaza and providing the light at the end of the tunnel and dissuading the, uh, them from, you know, radicalization and ex 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 extremist uh, kind of approaches. 
So this is undoubtedly a, a cardinal uh, uh, a point that needs to be at the at different uh, occasions brought to the forefront of of conversation. Now, the, the confrontation, of course, left many Palestinians in Gaza homeless. Uh, the estimates are uh, uh, around uh, around 10,000. Uh, Egypt pledged 500 million uh, US dollars to start rebuilding and reconstructing in, in, in Gaza. The difference uh, is that there is no cash involved in whatever Egypt has announced in terms of its efforts to reconstruct, but it's actually uh, 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 material that will be providing uh, uh, Egyptian companies that will be at the forefront of these efforts in terms of reconstructing. Now, uh, you know, Egypt uh, considers that all of these tracks are, are, are instrumental in terms of paving the way for the conditions necessary for direct negotiations. Whenever this is, uh, 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 and the situation on the ground allows this, it's important, uh, an integral part of the holistic approach. Whatever we're doing in terms of the ceasefire, sustaining the ceasefire, rebuilding, reconciliation, all this needs to cater to one direction, which is, uh, which sees at the, uh, at the as, as the ultimate goal, uh, 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 direct negotiations resume in a peaceful uh, process towards a peaceful uh, outcome. Uh, so this is what I can say at the very beginning, and I'll stop here and, and follow the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Zahran. You, you described the, um, the context in which Egypt plays this important role, and it's not just, as you mentioned, about this particular ceasefire, but it really is linked to um, not just the Israeli-Palestinian arena, but the Arab-Israeli arena and the larger uh, geo geopolitics um, in the region as well. Um, I'd like to turn to you, David, now. You've uh, been in Israel and the Palestinian territories recently. You're also an expert on the Israeli political domestic scene. We've seen a change in government. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu is, is out. Um, Naftali Bennett is now prime minister. How will these internal dynamics affect the implementation of the ceasefire, which again, continues to be uh, quite fragile? Thank you, Marissa, for having me. And it's good to see other very distinguished members. It's an honor to be with uh, Ambassador Zahud, Zahran, my good friend, Jim Jeffrey, Mark Green. Uh, so thank you, Marissa, for organizing and having and putting this together. Thank you very much. Look, it's, it's a coming back from there, and I was in Ramallah too. I, I feel that it's a very unstable situation on the ground to begin with. And then we'll, we'll get to your point, uh, which is the domestic dimension of this in, in Israel. I mean, the, un, the instability, why it's so unstable is because perceptions of what happened in this conflict are, are not agreed upon, basically. You have uh, Yechia Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, who politically feels he's flying high as a kite. I will point that all the Khalil Shakaki polls, the Palestinian leading pollster, who I've been friendly with for over 30 years, uh, usually right after a conflict, you know, say Hamas wins or something. And then after three months, things kind of settled back down. But right now, he's feeling a sense of victory. The Israelis feel they've achieved a lot of military uh, successes too. Um, and basically, the Sinwar view is we want the status quo plus plus. And the Israeli view is we want the status quo minus for Hamas, but not for Gaza. And how do you draw that distinction? And that draws on something that Ambassador Hood and I think um, Ambassador Zahran alluded to, which is a belief, well, uh, let's find ways to help Gaza without helping Hamas. And Ambassador Hood was very explicit about that. Um, that means really going back to the formula. There was a, basically a ceasefire. No, no one published in the New York Times, but basically since 2018, Israel and Hamas have had a kind of a, a ceasefire. And, and, the, and the concept, the contours have been like this. You stop firing rockets, no incendiary balloons, and Israel will help facilitate with Qatar $360 million a year 
that would go through the United Nations for, uh, for, for public works, money for, to poor people, more fuel that would mean the electricity power plant in Gaza would get closer to 24 hours. We wish it would be at a fully 24 hours. And that was basically the last three years until May. But what happened midpoint is that Hamas lost interest in the United Nations. And they said, we want the money directly and we'll decide where the money goes. And the money sadly went for rockets for this uh, metro tunnel that is, you know, I've heard, you know, from the UN that goes, uh, you know, hundreds of kilometers around Gaza. Uh, but it certainly is very extensive. And the net effect, and also I must say, which is a bit hard to understand, the one place that I find hard to understand, maybe Ambassador Zahran could, could put some light on it, the opening of the Salah Hadin gate near Rafa, that where a lot seemed to go in. Everyone wants humanitarian aid for Gaza. I want to repeat that. But the difference is, does the money go directly to Hamas or not? And at a certain point, the Qatari money went directly to Hamas, and they used it for, for nefarious purposes. Now, Qatar might say, well, Israel signed off at a certain point. I've heard conflicting views on that. But basically, the Hamas view is we don't want the United Nations. We want to take the money. We want to decide where the money goes. And that's certainly not the Israeli view that has seen now four rounds of, uh, of rocket fire coming at its citizens and now and then retaliating. So I think it's an unstable situation, uh, frankly. And, 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 and you know, Qatar view of sending an invoice is, well, we're going to send out balloons and we're going to burn your fields, all your farm fields near Gaza. We're going to burn as much as we can until we get the Qatari money. We're holding you, Israel, responsible. So these are some of the details you don't always read about in the newspapers, but this is kind of, I think, what's going on in Gaza. This issue, Ambassador Zahran said correctly, and Egypt has done a fantastic job, I think, on, on trying to be a mediator, and I only have respect for Cairo. But, um, you know, this issue of prisoners is, it's not a, a level playing field. You know, Israel says they have two dead Israeli soldiers and two people that have had uh, have issues of disabled people that cross the border. And Hamas wants over a thousand people. That's what happened last time with the Gilad Shalit deal. They got one prisoner out over a thousand. And, and I think over 200 of the people they released went back to practicing terror, including Yechia Sinwar himself. So the prisoner issue was also a, a, a big complication. So now to your question, Marissa, which is, okay, now on top of all these objective differences, where does the domestic politics in Israel play into it? So on one hand, if the Netanyahu government had primarily uh, members from the right, this government has fewer members from the right, more from the center, more from the left, and also an Arab party for the first time is a member, a full member of the coalition. So uh, it's an Islamic party, actually. Uh, it's a very diverse government. And, but they are also united saying, look, help Gaza, but don't help Hamas. So the question is, can you thread that needle? Now, ideally, it should be as Ambassador Hood said, which is um, help the PA. That's what Secretary of State Tony Blinken said when he visited Ramallah in, in May after the conflict. The question is, will Hamas let them? And being in Ramallah, talking to the PA people, what's clear is Hamas said, no, 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 no. We won the war. You guys stay out. You stay in the West Bank. We'll stay in Gaza. We're in charge. We have nothing to do with you. Now, in theory, they'll say, but if you, you let us into the PLO at a time of succession for free, where we don't have to make any concessions to signed agreements between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, well, maybe then we'll talk to you. But all these reconciliation efforts have been going on since 2007, since uh, the Mecca uh, talks that the Saudis brokered, the Doha talks, and I think Ambassador Zahran will, will affirm it. And again, I think Egypt's done fantastic efforts to try to bring the Palestinian uh, movements together, whether it's from Abbas to Hamas, from the West Bank to Gaza. But since 2007, and we're now 14 years later, it hasn't worked. And, and so that's, that's hard. And, the, and the, the final piece is what sort of negotiations, if you got one going, what happened? The United States under Democrat and Republican administrations have tried to do what's called final status, go to the end game, solve the whole damn conflict 
and uh, and that was Bill Clinton in, 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 in Camp David in 2000, Condoleezza Rice in Annapolis 2007-8. I was part of the State Department team under in the Obama administration under Secretary of State Kerry. Martin Indyk was our team leader. And we tried it a third time. And the Venn diagram just doesn't extend. So if we do resume talks, it should be over something that is attainable. Um, so all, I'm bringing all this not to you know, depress people, but just saying that a, a lot of the, uh, there's some objective problems. Now you've got you know, Naftali Bennett, the new prime minister, who uh, is trying to keep this government together. His concept is consensus, kind of apple pie and motherhood. Uh, let's not look for that which is divisive, but let's look for that which unites. And I think um, most Israelis would wanna see the Palestinians having a better life, but they just don't want Hamas firing rockets at them. The question is, can they draw you know, that distinction well? Uh, Netanyahu was in the opposition firing proverbial spitballs at them, saying, you're weak, you're weak, you're weak, and you're going to cave to Hamas. And I wouldn't be surprised, frankly, if there are those elements who want a second round uh, saying, look, you're not going to get Sinwar to, to come down from his euphoria. And a second round is going to happen, uh, should happen. I don't think the government in Israel wants a second round. Uh, I think some of the security services that are usually pride themselves on their pragmatism, however, don't see a way out because they don't see the UN being able to fulfill that role. If somehow with the Egyptian and American um, umbrella, there was some way that would weigh in here and says, no, everything has to go through the United Nations or the Palestinian Authority, either one. And Hamas has to join, let's say a technocratic government of uh, Palestinians uh, with the PA, it might make a difference. Now you can say, well, look, we've made statements in Washington, we've made statements in Cairo, people know what we think. But I think that unless there is a concerted US move, I'm concerned that this impasse is just gonna intensify because Hamas is gonna say, where's my money? Where's my money? I don't wanna hear the word United Nations. So I'm a bit concerned and I'm a bit concerned that Bennett, who only has six seats as the prime minister, never happened in Israeli history, you know, that he'll feel more pressure from the right, who's, and they will say to him the equivalent of what people said to John F. Kennedy in 1961. I'm not comparing him to John F. Kennedy, of course, but, uh, or to Olmert in 2006. They're testing you. Hamas is testing you the way a, a new young president was tested in the United States, the way Olmert was tested after Sharon you're being tested after Netanyahu. And I worry that's gonna mean the prospects of a second round. I think the only way out, Marissa, is for the US and Egypt the two, and Qatar, the three relevant actors, frankly, in this whole story to clear up and tell Hamas, there's just no way out. You have to do this through the United Nations and you have to become folded into the PA. It could be a technocratic government, meaning it isn't official Hamas people, at the table, but people that you know of. And uh, I think that there, that there has to be a clear sense of, op of, of policy direction because left on their own, I, I worry this is just gonna get worse. It's a very unstable situation. I wish I had better news. I feel like a skunk at a garden party, but anyway, that's uh, Jim Jeffrey knows me for many, many years and I'm just being very candid in telling you why I'm, I'm concerned, that's all. Of course, thank you so much, David. And, and we'll get back to you uh, with a few questions um, and, and probably follow up on some of your points about um, proactive US engagement as key to moving this forward. Um, so I'd like to turn to you, Ambassador Jeffrey, um, to also give us sort of the geopolitical implications of what happened. Many people in the region continue to see um, sort of the, the core issue um, as the Palestinian-Israeli issue, uh, and, and perhaps no longer the Arab-Israeli issue because we've seen recent developments uh, last year uh, with the historic signing of the Abraham Accords. Um, but many countries in the region believe it remains to be the core issue. Others um, see the region through the prism of Iran, which on the US agenda continues to be the, the number one challenge. Um, so how do you read the geopolitics, uh, particularly in light of what happened in Gaza um, two months ago? Uh, thank you, Marissa, and thanks for uh, putting this together. Uh, first of all, greetings to all of my colleagues, uh, Ambassador Zaran, uh, 
uh, Joey, David, it's good to see you again. Uh, I'll make three very, very brief points because uh, I can't begin to compete on the details of the uh, uh, ceasefire or the background to it uh, as my three colleagues can. Uh, first of all, uh, the role of regional geopolitics, particularly Iran. Secondly, uh, shifting Arab uh, Israeli relations. And thirdly, the United States. Uh, to start with the first, and apologies to Joey Hood, when we worked together over the last three years, he's heard this from me many times. Uh, the role of Iran and everything that is destabilizing in the region cannot be overemphasized. Hamas profusely thanked uh, Iran for its support, not only diplomatic, but also, let's face it, in terms of weapon systems uh, after the last crisis. Uh, Iran not only supports Hamas, it also supports even more radical <clears throat> extremist terrorist groups in Gaza uh, who are capable of uh, blowing up ceasefires even when Hamas does seem to be uh, willing to play. Uh, but it goes further than that. Uh, Israeli uh, uh, leaders and people throughout the region stress uh, the danger of Iranian rocket and missile programs. Uh, be they in southern Lebanon, be they increasingly, uh, although they're under pressure in Syria, uh, be they elsewhere, we've even seen them in Iraq, uh, and certainly in Yemen, uh, striking targets throughout the region. Israel has to keep, when it is engaging on any Palestinian issue, particularly a military issue with Gaza, one eye focused on Iran, because of the fear that uh, it could be drawn into a conflict or its deterrence against such a conflict could be weakened depending upon what it does on one front, it faces even more serious problems on another. Uh, the uh, barrage of Hamas rockets uh, challenged but did not overwhelm the Iron Dome and other Israeli defense systems. That may not be the case uh, in the future uh, dealing with uh, rockets and missiles out of Southern Lebanon, out of Syria, out of uh, Gaza all at the same time are in close proximity. So that is something that Israel has to think about. Secondly, uh, one thing that uh, did turn out better from the standpoint of Israel was uh, the relative support of uh, Arab states. We begin, of course, with Egypt, uh, with Jordan, uh, and with Qatar, but also the uh, four Arab states of the Abraham Accords. Uh, while they were unhappy, as they should be, with some of the things Israel was doing in Jerusalem, uh, basically uh, stood by their new uh, friend and partner uh, on in regional security, Israel, uh, throughout this uh, campaign and certainly did not take the side of Hamas. That is a shift, not a major shift, but certainly a perceptible one from the situation during the 2006 Lebanon war, when I think most of you who know the history remember, uh, initially Arab states made noises uh, in favor of Israel vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, but after uh, uh, President Assad's Hoffman speech, uh, all of the, uh, uh, all of the uh, commentaries uh, went silent throughout the Arab world. Uh, it's a different Arab world. Uh, and it's an Arab world that uh, working with uh, the international community, the UN, uh, and particularly the United States can make uh, ever greater contributions to peace of the sort we just saw uh, with Egypt uh, in this recent conflict. Finally, the United States. Uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, administration, like all administrations, this isn't a specific criticism, uh, decides that it sets the priorities for the international agenda. Uh, good luck. Uh, the pivot to Asia was brought to a screaming halt in May when uh, Asia's aircraft carriers all get shipped off to the Middle East, uh, largely because of Afghanistan, which is, while it's outside of Joey Hood's responsibilities, is really part of the Middle East, and of course, the entire uh, diplomatic uh, apparatus of the United States, as Joey laid out, uh, dropped most everything else to focus on uh, the Gaza ceasefire. This is the nature of the Middle East that every administration has experienced. We can dream about pivoting to things that are geostrategically even more important, and I'm the first to admit that China is the biggest threat we face, but the Middle East is itself very important, and it is very, very hard to ignore. I think that's a lesson that everybody's gotten, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ambassador Jeffrey. Before um, I turn back to you, uh, Dasud, I just want to remind our viewers uh, to submit their questions via Twitter to at Wilson Center MEP or email them to MEP at Wilson.
Um, das Hood, you've, you've heard um, uh, from David, from Ambassador Jeffrey as well, um, and, and as well as from Ambassador Zahran, about the important role of the United States, um, a proactive role, particularly to ensure that this ceasefire holds and that um, we're back to the negotiation table or back to talks at least. Um, but you've also described sort of at this point more of a minimal approach with a focus of course on the humanitarian um, assistance in, in Gaza. Um, uh, there are also very high expectations from other regional leaders. I know the King of Jordan is due in DC um, and uh, that will probably be uh, very high on, on his agenda. I'm in fact moderating this discussion from, from Amman um, and this is and continues to be the number one um, issue for the country. So um, what, what are you telling your regional allies, um, particularly those who insist that the US role and in leading this remains integral to um, any progress moving forward. Well, Marissa, I think that um, our partners know very well how active um, we are being on this, but again, it's quiet. And this is something new for the US government, not just going back from the past administration, but several administrations prior to that as David Makovsky uh, so well laid out. Uh, the typical approach for the past 20 something years has been, let's go for the whole Megillah, let's go for a Nobel Peace Prize, you know, let's try to get everything solved and it just hasn't worked. So what this administration is trying to do is to see, can we just make lives better for people? Can we just stop the dying and then make lives better for people, whether they're, they're Israeli or Palestinians? Uh, that's gonna take a lot of work all on its own. And you've heard some of the challenges here right now. Uh, the Qataris are not going to want to go back in with substantial assistance without knowing that Israelis and the United States are, and the Palestinian Authority are basically on board with the approach. Um, Egypt has a, an ambitious uh, program of its uh, $500 million donation. No doubt there are going to be challenges in implementing that because it's something new. Uh, but we've got to try something new because we've, uh, we've tried the same approach over and over and it didn't work. So I would not say that this is a minimalist approach. It's a different approach and it's quiet. Um, but uh, you know, these consultations are happening every single day. I've been monitoring my email here uh, just as we've been talking about how the secretary is gonna make a phone call to uh, a key leader. I was with him in uh, Rome and in Berlin when he had a whole bevy of side meetings um, last week with uh, regional counterparts. And this, was, this issue was top of the agenda. Uh, because uh, I had to smile as Ambassador Jeffrey was talking about how uh, every administration likes to try to pivot away from the Middle East and focus on uh, other priorities. And it just, you can't do that fully. I mean, the human race has somehow decided that the Middle East is going to be really important. And that's been true for thousands of years. So uh, we know that that's true now. And it's going to be true uh, going forward in the future. So we've got to keep working on all of these issues. But again, you're just not going to see it as uh, the big headlines uh, and shuttle diplomacy that you might have seen uh, on, you know, the era of Kissinger or or some other, uh, you know, administration. Um, but we will have people uh, in going into the region, making these phone calls, having these consultations. Uh, between key leaders uh, as we go along. And you know we'll see what we can do. If we can at least stop the dying and we can get humanitarian assistance flowing in a way that basically satisfies everyone and actually gets to Palestinian people and that helps them, that'll be, uh, that'll be something good to start with. Thank you, uh, Dasud. I wanna to turn to you, Ambassador Zahran. Um, on that very point, um, uh, basically what Egypt expects from the Biden administration at this point. What would you like to see? Um, and is it is it too early um, to, to say that the two-state solution at, at this particular point no longer is, is viable that it, and it'll become more and more complicated to get there if um, we don't see more traction? Uh, well, well, thank you, Marissa. Let me uh, quickly agree with... Uh with uh, Ambassador Jeffrey and also Ambassador Hood. Uh, you know, uh, pivoting away from the Middle East is, I don't think, any option. Uh, and I think I've uh, 
made a reference before that uh, if you decide to leave the Middle East, the Middle East will never uh, succumb to your decision. It will continue to uh, follow uh, your uh, wherever you are, Asia or elsewhere. So that is one. Two, I think, um, you know, we've been uh, very uh, appreciative of the support that the Biden administration has, has and the role the Biden administration has, has uh, shown in terms of, you know, supporting the efforts uh, towards attaining a ceasefire. What we need to see is a continued uh, role that is uh, proactive, uh, proactive in terms of, um, and I will probably add to uh, uh, Ambassador Hood point, uh, yes, important to secure uh, humanitarian and reconstruction and the livelihood of people and to make life more, uh, uh, you know, uh, prosperous. Uh, but also, I'll just add to that, that we need to see to it that the effort on the overall comprehensive nature of the of the of peace should not uh, be uh, a shelf, uh, meaning that whatever steps we're taking to, uh, to towards alleviating the suffering, uh, uh, um, uh, attention to humanitarian, attention to uh, reconstruction should lead, using the spirit of the Abraham Accords as well, should lead to direct negotiations. And, and this is part of our holistic approach. And this is what I think um, the, uh, uh, the administration is cognizant of. Uh, the matter is, of course, timing. But let me just go back in time and say, well, when has been any timing opportune? It's, it's always a question. It, it, it's a decision you take. It's a policy issue uh, uh, that you will have to consider uh, and to, to move ahead once you feel that you know, you've been able to achieve success on the fronts that you're working on. The two-state solution let me agree that it is eroding uh, the need for uh, to work towards its revival is of importance, at least to, you know, to the minds over here at the embassy, at my own mind and people back home and throughout the region. I personally don't see how another sort of solution uh, would be in the interests of either Israel itself and its security or the Palestinians and their aspiration and statehood. So, uh, meaning the one state. The one state is simply, to my mind, uh, you know, uh, boggling. Uh, it, does, it does not cater to anyone's security. Uh, so the two-state solution has to remain live, has to remain at the forefront of efforts, as, at least as a target, and in accordance, of course, to resolutions, uh, international legitimacy, but also, in terms of providing the necessary uh, uh, conditions to work towards the two-state solution is of extreme importance. We all know that the Clinton administration was very close to reaching the uh, the, the peace, you know, true breakthrough, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, but in the aftermath of that, we had a number of uh, um, understandings uh, with Olmert uh, on land swaps, for example. And this is how you could always advance with the notion of two states. So this will be, at a certain time, the core of attention, whether it is Jerusalem, whether it is refugees, whether it is borders. All these issues will come at their time, as that is why they're called final status issues. But the drive towards them uh, we never should lose sight of. Thank you uh, very much, Ambassador Zahran. Um, David, you you mentioned um, earlier the important role of the United States, but also you know working together with Egypt and Israel, um, uh, and perhaps moving towards something attainable. But you didn't talk about what that thing is that you think is attainable. Um, and um, and Das Hood um, basically described. Um, the, the U.S. approach is one very much focused now on uh, bettering Palestinian lives and, and improving conditions on the ground. 
um, is that the attainable thing or, or are you hoping for more? I, 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 yeah, I'd like a bit more, but uh, I'm glad you got me on that, Marissa, because that's my favorite topic. Uh, you know, define what is gradualism to do what Ambassador Zahran just said, which is to have two states as the target. I completely agree with him, and I think Ambassador Hood would agree with that too. Um, you know, I, I sometimes use sports analogies, and so it travels well in America, but not maybe in Amman or other places. But so if, it's, if you can't hit the home run, you know, hit some singles and doubles, or to put it in the international sports, if you can't run the marathon, at least run the 5K race. Uh, do something that's attainable. Here are two examples, because I always like to be practical and specific. First of all, now probably Bennett, I've spoke to him about eight or nine times, the new prime minister. And he's always said to me, uh, look, um, there are, most of the Palestinians live in the A plus B areas, uh, maybe 80 to 90% of the West Bankers. You know, he talked for autonomy on steroids, a Marshall Plan. Uh, now that might mean other foreign assistance, I don't know, but okay, take him at his word. And, and this fits with what Ambassador Hood was saying, you know, about improving the economics. Imagine if the A plus B areas where 80 to 90% of the Palestinians live, you would have um, economic projects. You would bring in the American private sector, even the Gulf states and the Emirates have had their problems with the PA, for example. But uh, they've told me uh, privately, senior Emirati officials, if there was a private sector initiative for all the Palestinian cities and the surrounding areas, you know, we would contribute, you know, if the Saudis contribute and a few of the other wealthier states, we'll do our part. Whatever the bad blood between MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, the Crown Prince, and, uh, and President Abbas of the PA. Um, so what about a private sector effort to improve the A plus B zones? Uh, what about uh, also giving the Palestinian police in, in Area B more authority? but show something is moving because I'm a little nervous about just saying, let's get them negotiating because the question to the experts is negotiate about what? Are we gonna try to hit the home run ball again? We're gonna try to win the marathon? Our goal is what Ambassador Zavran said. The goal is a two state solution, but we have to get there. So let's do some practical things. So I think you know an A plus B focus is something that would work for Bennett. It's not the end point, it's not economic peace. It's a way to get started. And it's a way to give Palestinian police in these areas more authority. Uh, you might want to also, by the way, in that context, also bring in more workers from Gaza. That, in the words of Ambassador Hood, people who are fully vetted, that don't oppose, you know, don't become a security risk. Uh, that would be good for the Gaza economy too, and would not make them less reliant on Hamas. Um, point three: What you could do is, I think, is, and this would be a little more controversial in, in parts of the, uh, the new coalition, but I don't think it's impossible, is to say no building outside the security barrier. 85% of the Israelis who are over the green line, I mean, they're over the 67 lines, are in 8% of the land largely adjacent to those lines. Ambassador Zahran mentioned the land swaps with Omar, but, but here, imagine if you would say, you know, not adding any new people, not a single new person outside the security barrier. That's 85% of the West Bank, no new settlers. That would at least preserve the option for two states. And so my point is don't shut the door. You can't solve it all now. You can't do all the final status issues, the borders, the security arrangements, the refugees to Jerusalem, uh, the, accepting the character of the other state. Okay, if you, there is, this is, if there's one sentence you remember from what I say, I hope you remember this sentence. Between solving the conflict and managing the conflict, they're shrinking the conflict. I think you could shrink it. You can make it, you know, minimize the differences between the parties. So it's more bridgeable. You could bridge over a river. You can't bridge over an ocean if the differences are so wide. So I, I think there's something very specifically that can be done. But my fear is if you don't do anything, you shut the door over time. So it's not just you can't solve it now, but you won't be able to solve it in the future. So stop the slide to the one state approach. I guess that would be my word, words. And, and I think the way to get there, frankly, and here it gets back to Ambassador Hood, is like if you use the Emirati template on the Abraham Accords, imagine if you had some partial uh, deal with, with the Saudis. Uh, maybe you couldn't do a, a grand deal because the king has certain views, 
on final status. I get that. But imagine if you took partial steps. And just like, you know, remember last summer, it was not in ancient history. The summer of 2020, there was all this ferment in the Netanyahu government for annexation. But suddenly what happened? The Emiratis kind of swooped in, offered the Abraham Accords, and, and Israelis who can't always agree if it's light outside or dark outside, 80%, 80% is a huge number. 55% would be a landslide. 80% said they preferred peace with an Arab state over annexation. So normalization, Trump, to excuse the expression, annexation. And here too, I think, what about if we think creatively on trying to not just deepen the Abraham Accords, broaden the Abraham Accords and show the Israelis, okay, but you're gonna have to do your part too. And that means you gotta stop anything over the, over the barrier. And I think just the way it worked with the Emirates, when they said it's either normalization or annexation, the Israelis said, we prefer normalization to annexation. Here too, I think you could come up with a package. It won't solve every single problem, okay? But it will go a long distance in limiting this conflict. Uh, so it's not just between managing and solving it. It's limiting the differences. And I think this is uh, in, the, in the realm of the possible, what, 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 we could call it singles or doubles, or we could call it the 5K or the 10K race, however you wanna call it for an international audience. I think this is in the realm of the doable. I'll get back to you, David, to see what uh, if these ideas have traction um, in the new Israeli government, but also um, in Ramallah, where you were uh, recently. But I'll, I'll go back to Ambassador um, Jeffrey um, just for uh, a share, just feedback or thoughts um, on what you've heard so far, particularly with regards to um, a proactive U.S. role and what you see is feasible. Hmm. Uh, all in all, I think that on this issue. Uh, which I've followed intermittently now for 20 years, uh, the position that the uh, Biden administration is taking is wise. Uh, there is no real alternative to the two-state solution. We've got general agreement on this panel to that. Uh, but pursuing that, given the sensitivities involved, given the long history, uh, is something that requires step-by-step uh, -step work uh, I think that David's idea of shrinking the conflict on the one hand and um, uh, the Near East Bureau's idea uh, to do quiet diplomacy as opposed to big uh, dramatic diplomacy, which gathers a lot of attention, but also raises expectations are well aligned and also uh, match well what um, Ambassador Zaron has said. Uh, there is a real uh, opportunity at this point uh, because uh, the region is changing. Uh, while the United States will not pivot out of it, its relative role is not going to be as great as in the past. Uh, and there are pretty scary alternative security dynamics out there. It's not just Iran, which I mentioned before. It's also Russia, which has its eye on the Middle East and a much bigger role for it. Uh, we see this in Syria. We see it in Libya. Uh, we see it in some of Lavrov's uh, speeches on a new uh, order. And that will encourage people to, I think, uh, try to come to a lowest common denominator of what works in the region. Uh, as we just heard on uh, how the Emiratis managed to broker uh, uh, normalization over annexation, uh, there are going to be more compromises uh, if all of this architecture that we're now at the center of is to hold and less uh, absolutist demands that are uh, uh, flogged publicly. So uh, I'm actually pretty uh, optimistic by what I've heard. Thank you, Ambassador Jeffrey. I'm gonna turn to questions from the audience because we have quite a few um, that came in. Um, to, to Das Hood, with regards to the US administration, can we expect more concerted long-term development support of NGOs on the ground and will the Biden administration support these groups? I assume here we're talking about um, NGOs in the Palestinian territories, but specifically Gaza. Go ahead. Well, thank you for the question. As I uh, said in my opening remarks, uh, this is, you know, other than the UN, uh, we do send a significant part of our assistance through trusted and vetted NGO partners in Gaza and in the West Bank. And so as our funding 
uh, gets released from Congress and as it gets through the system, you're going to see more and more of that flowing to those organizations. Uh, because in our experience, that's what we found to be the most effective way of uh, going around uh, organizations like Hamas, and in some cases, the Palestinian Authority as well, because of their uh, inability to manage some of these resources. And so um, that's why we're going to be using these uh, NGOs. Now, I'm not sure what the person meant by uh, development work, but right now, uh, we're focusing primarily on humanitarian assistance. So people have water, they have food, they have health care. Then you can start thinking about uh, these uh, types of projects that uh, David Makovsky was talking about and that we certainly are working on very quietly, among other things that he mentioned and some other items as well. Uh, you know, how can you take advantage of this new geostrategic situation that Ambassador Jeffrey described so that you maybe have uh, Emirati private sector funding for, let's say, a water project that benefits Jordanians and Israelis and Palestinians across the board. Uh, these things weren't possible to even dream about a couple of years ago, and now uh, they're much closer to reality. Uh, you know, how can you think about uh, beyond NGOs, but governments working together and maybe getting assistance from NGOs as well in terms of uh, police training in terms of how do you manage uh, the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif when maybe you've got, uh, you know, a hundred Emirati tourists uh, there at the site and maybe some Palestinian youth start throwing some rocks at whomever. Uh, you know, that's going to be a very difficult and different situation than what you've seen over, you know, the past decades. These are the sorts of things that we need to be working through and that could provide those ways of making the conflict just a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller, as David mentioned. Thank you, Dashud. Um, to Ambassador Zahran, a question about what Egypt can do to ease the transport and delivery of needed and legitimate supplies via the Gaza-Egyptian border. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, uh... Thank you, uh, Marissa. Uh, well, let me say that we have uh, the uh, the Rafah crossing, which is uh, devoted to uh, to personnel. We have um, the Salah al-Din for uh, construction material. So, the what we've been able to put together in terms of uh, assistance to uh, alleviate the suffering in terms of uh, reconstruction was in the amount I've mentioned. And, and as I've mentioned, it's not cash, but it's actual projects on the ground being implemented. And they have uh, been designed as such for the purpose that we've all uh, agreed on. We need to be able to make sure that the resources we put are uh, channeled uh, through the proper uh, means and reach uh, their objective uh, without any kind of diversion. And this is uh, part of what I had explained uh, when it comes to the difference between the mechanism that we're uh, uh, creating today and the mechanism that we had in 2014. One of the ideas that we're floating around as well is to create a fund, an international fund, a UN fund that would have the ability to supervise uh, the implementation of these projects to alleviate also the uh, dire circumstances of Palestinians living uh, in Gaza. I think this is an idea worthwhile uh, in terms of uh, how to advance it. Uh, I think it caters to the, uh, uh, to the general uh, feeling here in the US that uh, uh, Ambassador Hood had also mentioned in terms of making sure that these uh, efforts are uh, concerted, uh, but also uh, channeled well. So this is what we're uh, doing. We've always uh, been uh, uh, receptive to the uh, uh, growing needs of the Palestinians in Gaza, and we will continue to do so. Let me just make a quick reference and use the opportunity to say that uh, Ambassador she uh, uh, Jeffrey had, had mentioned all the you know, extra regional or regional elements that are not uh, necessarily uh, benign in their interventions. We see uh, uh, chaos in, 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 in all parts of the region. 
Syria, Libya, Yemen, and others, and 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 even in in Gaza itself. So this is an angle that I completely agree with, uh, on him with. Uh, it, it needs our attention. It needs a, a lot of focus, and not to uh, to um, uh, 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 somehow overlook it. It needs to be center stage in our uh, in our attention. Now. I say this because of the following. If we are, have enough of the conflicts and the tensions that have marred the Middle East for long, let me say that the, 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 the recipe, the, 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 the only recipe uh, to easen all of these conflicts throughout the region is by tackling the core conflict in the region. So uh, we would be doing ourselves in the region good. We would be doing the world good in terms of really focusing on the elements that would pave the way towards that kind of direct negotiation that we spoke about for the two-state solution to remain, uh, to, to remain alive uh, as the only viable solution uh, for the conflict. We would see as a consequence, the easing of so many conflicts throughout the region if we are able to tackle that main conflict that fuels radicalization and extremists throughout uh, throughout the region. Can I ask uh, uh, Marissa? Ambassador can I ask, yeah. Can I yes, just go ask ahead, Ambassador please. Yeah. on a question? Because, you know, I, I, I spoke, you know, in Israel that basically there's such huge respect for, for Cairo and their understanding of the importance of bringing stabilization to Gaza and a better life for people. and they feel that that they Israel and Egypt are very much on the same page on wanting not to usually help Hamas but to help Gaza, and uh, you know to do as Ambassador Hood keeps saying about improving people's lives. So in the macro, I find there's this strategic convergence, but I I must say I was a bit troubled on my trip because you asked me to talk about some of this. Is that I had six or seven Israelis, another four or five Palestinians. They all raised the Sheikh, um, you know, the, the Salah Hadin gate, uh, because it didn't just open after the conflict. It's not just about getting now the Egyptians building, but this has been going on for a few years. And I, I wonder if there was some way, um, you know, if it was just humanitarian, everybody's for it, of course. But, uh, you know, usually the building, the, the materials have gone through Kerem Shalom, but this new bridge, this, this new crossing opened up in the last several years. And I feel there's no synchronization on it. And I was very puzzled by it because I know the respect that Egypt has held in, uh, in trying to improve things in this strategic convergence. And this just seemed like a very discordant note that it, it wasn't synchronized. And I don't understand it. And I thought if it's okay to use this opportunity having an Egyptian representative to explain it uh, to us because there was a lot of concern that it was used to divert Hamas, maybe Egypt didn't intend it, but that this is partly where the tunnels, the cement is coming from and, uh, and things like that for uh, the underground tunnels and, and for the rockets. Um, so I don't know, maybe Ambassador Zahran could, you could solve this mystery for me because it's coming at, at a time of this respect for Cairo. Thanks, David. Well, Ambassador Zahran. Marissa, thank you and thank you, David. Uh, let me let me just make uh, this point here. Uh, you've referred to the tunnels. You refer to the smuggling, and uh, and let me say that these the, the joint borders we have 13 and a half kilometers uh, with Gaza have been a huge a huge headache to Egypt uh, in terms of it being detrimental to our own national security in Sinai and throughout Egypt as a whole. And, uh, and I always make that, uh, you know, uh, uh, analogy with, uh, with our 100, uh, with our 1,200 kilometers with, with Libya. But anyhow, back to these 13 and a half kilometers, everything that was uh, used for, uh, uh, through these tunnels were illegal and, Ill, uh, and maybe some would consider legitimate in terms of the foodstuffs in terms of uh, things that catered to livelihoods of Palestinians. But nevertheless, our point was that this should end and the measures that we've taken in Sinai 
on the borders with Gaza are only indicative to the amount of resolve that we had in order to shut these tunnels down. So if we're able, if we've been successful in doing so, there had to be a way up ground, above ground, to continue to cater to the needs of the people. Now, the only thing I can assure you here in this conversation is that nothing that Egypt does is, uh, is not coordinated with either Israel or the Palestinian Authority. Now, uh, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to sit and chat uh, uh, in the near future, and we can expand on this uh, later on. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Zahran. We have um, a few more questions um, and about uh, 15 minutes uh, to go. So um, one coming in from Maya Basha at the Washington Institute. Um, and uh, I guess this would be addressed to Dashood, but also um, Ambassador Zahran. What steps are the US and Egypt willing to take if there continues to be increases in illegal settlements and demolitions in the occupied West Bank? If no such steps are being taken, what does this mean for the long-term peace process? Uh, Dashood? Well, I don't want to speculate on what might happen if this and if that. Uh, that's always a dangerous and perilous path. Uh, for a diplomat to go down, but uh, I will just restate our uh, policy, which is that we want to maintain this ceasefire and try to de-escalate the situation by avoiding destabilizing unilateral acti activities on all sides, and that includes incendiary balloons, it includes rockets, it includes airstrikes, it includes uh, 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 settlement activity, annexation of West Bank territory, uh, demolitions of Palestinian homes, uh, and, and all the rest, um, because we believe that those things just exacerbate tensions. We, of course, believe that Israel has uh, an absolute right to defend itself. So we're not saying that uh, if those rockets do come that they can't respond. They absolutely have to. Of course, any nation would do that. Um, but we want to avoid that sort of cycle of violence. So no unilateral uh, destabilizing actions on either side. Uh, and so, um, you know, th that's the, the path that we're going to take. And, uh, you know, if things happen as we go along, then we'll have to address them as we do. And we'll do so quietly for the most part. Thank you, Das Hood. Uh, Ambassador Zahran, on the um, Egyptian um, steps that can be taken. Uh, well, let me say you've referred to a number of, uh, of developments that could or could not occur. Let me just say, uh, as a general overarching uh, position, uh, you know, the two-state uh, solution is uh, the uh, the only viable option. The Arab uh, the Arab Peace Initiative is also uh, live and on the table. Uh, anything that counters the spirit, anything in terms of expansion of uh, settlements, anything in terms of confiscating land or homes or evicting people from their homes. Uh, anything that uh, uh, erodes the the possible uh, 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 peace outcome in general uh, and runs counter to the peace spirit uh, is something that we've always called out and we will continue to call out. And this does not preclude the fact that we have our strong ties and strong links and uh, and 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 relations with the with the Israelis. They, in fact, at all times have been uh, appreciative of the fact that we're honest. We're honest in public as we're honest in private. Uh, and this will continue. Thank you, Ambassador Zahran. Um, David, this, this next question um, is from Lena Obermeyer, um, saying that the Egyptian ambassador stressed the coordination uh, with Jordan and Qatar, I think it was Das Hood who mentioned that in his in his remarks. Um, what are the future roles of the Gulf states that signed the Abraham Accords in Saudi Arabia? You already sort of mentioned a role for Saudi Arabia in um, in in you know your approach to shrink the conflict. But how do you see this role, um, particularly in the in the near to medium future? Well, I think. It like I mentioned, the A plus B idea, um, getting the members of the Abrahamic uh, Accord states and the Saudis to say, okay, 
you, you have your doubts about money going to governments, but we want a private sector initiative. And Ambassador Hood is going to appoint uh, someone from the American private sector who's going to focus on where most of the Palestinians live, A plus B, to do economic projects. Maybe it'll be industrial zones, it'll be other things. I think there could be a security component too to give the, the, the PA, PASF, the, the Palestinian Security Forces, more room and, and uh, to be more dominant in the B areas. But without, without that's look, it's 40% of the West Bank. But if you could show that people's lives are getting better and that there's an actual coordinator and no one could say the money is going to Hamas or the money is going to PA coffers. No, it's a private sector initiative. I've heard from senior Gulf people, we're in, we'll join it. So I would like to see that. I also think you might be able to do even some industrial zones, um, you know, near the Gaza border, maybe on the Israeli side. Now, I, you know, I admit that the, the second intifada, yeah, I could point to you at one point that, that, that when the intifada went up in smoke, so did the, the industrial zone. So there's no 100% guarantees. But I think things that would give people, you know, give, give people a stake in success, I think that is possible. And I talk to Israelis about more Gaza workers. I, I just think we should be creative. Um, and look, I would even think about this. And I heard that a senior Israeli talked to a senior Gulf official about even looking at the Egyptian side of Rafah, you know, uh, about here, maybe you could have Palestinians, you don't want to send money to Hamas, fine. But maybe there are things that uh, you could help with in, in the Egyptian side of Rafa, Palestinian workers that could come in and they would bring money home. So I think that the burden shouldn't just fall on Egypt uh, on a lot of this uh, reconstruction, but Gulf, the Gulf uh, people should help as well. So things and that you, employ people. And do you see um, or have you heard in your recent trip um, sort of traction from the Palestinians that this is something that they'd like to see, particularly yeah. with Gulf countries coming in to help with- Well, I was sector. told that Abbas personally has, is still, you know, he's angry from people who met Abbas that he's still angry, not about the Abraham Accords, interestingly, but because Mohammed Dahlan is based in the Emirates and he sees, you know, Dahlan as his big nemesis, he doesn't want to take their money. But we're not asking him to take you know, Emirati money. We're asking to say that there'll be a, a consortium of Gulf states that would contribute to these this economic push. I find it hard to believe that he would stop it. Look, I think if I could, Marissa, because I know we're running out of time a bit, yeah. I do think that what we need to, to, to stress in general is the Abbas succession in this whole context. And I think this is like the 800 pound elephant in the room, so to speak. That, um, that, that Hamas is, feels that it's high as a kite because it wants to maximize its political leverage for the post-Abbas period. And I think that's kind of the, the meta story here. And the question is, is if, if, you know, what the PA people in Ramallah are saying to me is, David, if they want in, we're not trying to block them, but we're just saying there's a price to joining this, this, this club and that is, you have to accept the agreements we've signed with Israel. And that means a, a diplomatic concession. And, and Hamas's view is no, we don't want to make any concessions. We, we want it all uh, because uh, we feel we want, et cetera. And so I think that is the context to a lot of this instability is a belief that we want to be best positioned uh, with the public and with Palestinian institutions on the eve of succession. And if we don't see that wider story of succession as looming, I think we're missing a big piece of the picture. Thanks, uh, David. In fact, uh, this would be a great topic for um, another panel discussion, uh, highlighting uh, particularly what's happening in the Palestinian territories, but Ramallah vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the future of Palestinian leadership and how it will affect the point. Absolutely. Um, we have a few uh, minutes left and a, a lot of questions. So I'll sort of try to um, uh, put them all uh, together. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll ask Ambassador Jeffrey to, to step in here um, and then uh, uh, perhaps Das Hood to answer this question. What role did Iran play in the military conflict between Hamas and Israel? 
Um, uh, there is abundant evidence indicating that Iran shares a strong economic and military relationship with Hamas. And if I may add to this, um, has this recent um, infighting between uh, Hamas and Israel, has it, it, it definitely um, helped Hamas uh, um, sort of rise again in the polls? And, and, and David mentioned um, polling changes, you know, uh, months into uh, wars. Uh, but has this also sort of elevated um, Iran's um, grip on that particular um, arena, um, knowing that there are uh, talks happening regarding uh, Iran's nuclear program? Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, good question, Marissa. And it gets to uh, the whole core of Iran's exploitation of Israel in its regional strategy. Uh, and so this is very much my personal view, uh, not something that can be uh, totally verified. Iran really doesn't want to uh, destroy Israel uh, other than as a, a practical problem if Israel gets in its way in some uh, 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 conflict or uh, some endeavor, uh, in part because Iran knows that it cannot destroy Israel, that Israel has uh, tremendous military capabilities that Iran can only dream of. Uh, and Iran is very well aware of that. The people running Iran, uh, the people who are really running Iran, are pretty uh, uh, are, are pr pretty aware of the realities in the region. Uh, what they see is, and what they have seen for many years is, as the Arab world and uh, Ambassador Iran described the step-by-step -step process, uh, moved closer to Israel, and the Arab is the Arab is really conflict was replaced more by a Palestinian-Israeli situation or issue, uh, Iran thought that that opened room for it to achieve some kind of uh, echo throughout the Islamic and Arab world uh, by taking a hardline position against Israel, essentially a similar position to that of Hamas as a state it shouldn't exist. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, while Israel uh, is faced with this uh, continued Iranian hardline position, it is seeing less and less residents, I think, uh, throughout the rest of the region. Uh, that's the uh, point of the Abraham Accords having held solid, as did Israel's other uh, various partners uh, at the top of the list, uh, Egypt, uh, then Jordan, uh, and then Qatar in its own uh, unique way. And uh, so this raises a question of just how valid is that Iranian strategy? Iran will continue to pursue it uh, because it sees Israel now uh, as uh, a key player in a coalition of regional states that is designed to deter and contain Iran. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's an interesting development. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, Iran has benefited significantly, certainly not as much as Hamas did, as David laid out, from the conflict. Uh, I think that uh, uh, not at all like in 2006, as I said, uh, led by Assad, the Hezbollah uh, Assad Iran rejectionist front did much better out of that conflict than they did out of this one. Thank you, um, Ambassador Jeffrey. We, we have time for Final thoughts um, to, to wrap this up. This has been a, a very rich discussion. Uh, there are lots of other questions and I apologize that we didn't get to all of them, uh, but I hope that uh, this will be the first of many other discussions um, on this important issue. Um, so I, I guess my ask um, to all of you, uh, your excellencies is to, to share, I guess, one takeaway from this discussion that you think might, um, might help the process move forward. Uh, I'll start with you, Das Hood. Well, thank you. It sounds to me like there's an awful lot of uh, convergence in terms of ideas here. Uh, just to reiterate what the administration's going after is to maintain the ceasefire uh, by avoiding destabilizing unilateral action on any side, uh, aid the Palestinians in a way that uh, follows the law and helps people directly and not Hamas. We'll be doing that with uh, our important partners like Egypt and Qatar. And with them and others, uh, we're gonna try to set the conditions to return to real discussions about a two-state solution through quiet diplomacy. And um, you know, if we can make progress on all of those things, I think uh, that will 
help us um, set the table once again for those talks to be actually fruitful. And meanwhile, we'll keep an eye on Iran, as Ambassador Jeffrey has said, they are uh, problematic here. Uh, their assistance has not been militarily decisive, but over time, uh, it could be increasingly so. And uh, at the same time, we're watching the Iranian strategy kind of backfire on itself as it pushes the Gulf states and Israel closer together. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a winning solution for the Iranians over time. Uh, but we will continue to keep an eye on it and press back on them everywhere uh, that we can, along with those uh, regional partners and allies uh, like Egypt. Thank you very much, uh, Das Hood. Ambassador Zahran. Well, thank you, uh, Marissa. Let me just say uh, uh, continuing efforts on uh, building on the ceasefire, uh, having a ceasefire sustained and uh, to cater to the needs, humanitarian, as well as reconstruction. We need to show the Palestinian people that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We need to uh, be able to uh, uh, dismiss any uh, factor that adds to their frustration and to actually add uh, on the on the on the uh, contrary to add to their hopes, uh, we need to see them uh, see that kind of hope to be able to uh, you know uh, uh, bring about a better sense of uh, of of, um, of of goodness as opposed to uh, extremists and 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 radicalization. We need to continue to work on the holistic approach in terms of factoring in the uh, direct uh, talks whenever they uh, are timely. Uh, we need to work towards that end. We need to see proactive engagement. Uh, we need to also focus on regional uh, actors and their behaviors. It's uh, not confined to Iran. Iran is certainly at the top of the list. Uh, and let me just say on Iran here, I think that the nuclear file, and this is our view in Egypt, should not be dealt with in isolation of their regional interjections. They should come into play and they should be uh, part of the overall package of whatever could be reached uh, when, uh, 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 when uh, as Iran is concerned. The other the last point I'll, I'll make is on uh, the need to support the Palestinian Authority, the need to support uh, President Abbas. Uh, we should not hold our support contingent to uh, theories of uh, succession, although uh, uh, succession is important to keep in mind, but as long as he's there, uh, we should be able, he's the one, he's the engineer, he's the real uh, uh, powerhouse behind the Oslo Accords and 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 uh, and uh, until this very day. Uh, we need to see them enabled, we need to see them show their ability to cater also to the Palestinians in, what, in the West Bank in terms of their needs, uh, and we need to show the Palestinian people that there is this kind of hope for us to be able to prevail. Um, and this was a very interesting discussion and I learned from it a lot. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zahran. Uh, David? Well, thank you. I wanna again, extend my thanks to you, Marissa, for organizing this and for a really a stimulating discussion. I, I felt there was a, a, a great sense of convergence between us all. Um, um, you know, the need to, to see the safe ceasefire being stabilized uh, and also the need to have a target of a two-state solution. And yet we all agreed uh, it would take real gradual steps, but I do think you could do what's possible to shrink the conflict. I just think the most urgent, because I try to focus on what is the most urgent, is to make sure that this ceasefire doesn't unravel. Uh, and you had, it, it worked for the last three years, and now I worry that uh, the perceptions of uh, who did what in May or such that left to their own devices, I think it could head to a second round of violence. And I just hope uh, with Ambassador Hood and Ambassador Zahran that there's a real effort by the United States and Egypt to ensure that really Hamas has uh, no way out and that because we're on the eve of a succession issue, that they are folded in, the, in a technocratic way into the PA and that the PA does have a greater role in Gaza. I, before I came to Ramallah, I wasn't sure that they wanted to play the role because Abbas's general view is somebody has to disarm Hamas and once they do, then come to us and then we'll go in. I think now they realize that there's a risk for the PA if they don't 
be more proactive, but without their comparative advantage is the international diplomatic system, frankly. That's their, that's what they bring to the table. So if they have the United States, Egypt, Qatar, I don't know if you could, uh, you know, Turkey is problematic in many ways, but if you could bring that power to be and saying, listen, we're not going to let you guys just let this thing unravel into a second round, but we are going to make sure that there are some clear procedures, clear constructs, that the money goes through the United Nations uh, or the PA. Uh, it's not going directly to Hamas. And the, uh, the issue of being within a PA framework, and this is what it'll take to join. Uh, this is the concessions you're going to need to make. But I think without this kind of supervision of the United States and others, I'm afraid things between the, these inconclusive talks won't just stagnate. Stagnate wouldn't be terrible, but it will descend into another round of violence, which I think would be tragic. I hope uh, you are wrong, David. <laughs> yes, I am the first person to hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Ambassador Jeffrey, last words to you. Um, unlike David, I remain, as I was an hour ago, optimistic. I think that we heard realistic ways forward. I think that the uh, tenor of the international community and the states and actors in the region's reaction to this latest tragic outburst of violence has been uh, notably different than what we have seen in oh so many other ones involving either Israel uh, and the Palestinians, Israel and Lebanon or other uh, uh, competitors in the region. Uh, the, the consensus, the level of consensus throughout almost every country in the region on how to go forward, at least in general terms. The devil is in the details and David has laid them out as has the uh, 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 Department of State and uh, uh, Ambassador Montas. But nonetheless, uh, the general consensus on how to move forward is stronger than we have seen in a long time. And I think that's a basis upon which we can all build. Thank you again, Marissa. Thank you, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, das Hood, uh, Ambassador uh, Marta Zahran, David Makovsky, and Ambassador Jeffrey, thank you very much uh, for your time today and, and for sharing your thoughts on this uh, very important topic. More discussions um, on this um, will be planned for the next few months. Uh, so we hope that you will also tune in and thank you for um, listening.